Welcome to the Free Money Podcast. This is a show where we explore what's keeping the world from investing in progress, answer the questions on the minds of people in the know, and give you the Brooklyn Bay Area consensus about institutional investing that you desperately crave. Serving up the latter bit of that, I'm Sloan Artel. <laughs> and blowing it, I'm Ashby. <laughs> And serving up the latter part of that, this is Ashby Monk, and and while we're at it, we're going to take this whole wacky world of sovereign funds and pension funds and show you how to put the puzzle together. That's, I mean, I you know, with what little credibility you have left after that introduction debacle, I, I, I'd like to see how this all comes together. Aren't we editing that out? I sure <laughs> no, hope we're yeah. editing that out, no? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, we'll see. <laughs> I think that I think that intro is going to go with the show that we have planned. Yes, yes we actually indeed. made it. We made a tentative plan, which kind of goes against our normal yes operandi. So we actually know what we're talking about here. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I think it's important to self disrupt given the opportunity. It is. You we know, bring innovation to our lack of planning. We have brought small amounts of planning. Yeah, and you know, I, I think you know, I, my, my personal goal for this thing is to get you know as as a leading Canadian, uh, to get your comments on the uh, the recent election and uh, sure. the outlook for Canadian the Canadian blah 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 for the Canadian uh, strategic maple syrup reserve, uh, you know, should we expect uh, any kind of updates there? It's a really good question. I'm glad you you did not ask me about the governance of pension funds. <laughs> Instead, we're jumping into much more kind of relevant topic to my household, <laughs> uh, which is the Federation of Quebec's Maple Syrup Producers, which mm. is a, a group many of you know about. Um, Large institutional fund. investor. It, it probably has an endowment fund, if we're <laughs> honest. <laughs> right? FPAQ. They, they have all the hey, money. Hey, I got to go get a mandate from the FPAQ. <laughs> but the thing what the FPAQ is doing is it has a strategic reserve of maple syrup um, because we need a lot and we don't ever want to run out as a Canadian. I can tell you that I'm mean, I literally like we're joking right now, but I literally in my pantry have like three jugs of syrup, maple syrup that have like handles on them. Not oh my just gosh. like, Hey, I'm a poor little, no, it's got handles. That's not, how much it is. These are not. And I, I take it. These have no hydrogenated corn syrup. You know, this is, this is the real deal here. I'm going to be real with you, Sloan, and tell you that me and my two children were full on tree sap, maple syrup peeps. My mm. wife, she does this like Aunt Jemima junk. Uh, oh, that must be a real problem in the relationship. <laughs> we just shake our heads at that stuff and we're like, dude, that is literally a, an atrocity around yeah. this table. But anyway. Yeah, you're sitting over there with the real stuff from Vermont, and uh, and she's uh, you know sitting there with this Aunt Jemima nonsense. You got no idea what's going on. That must be a must... <laughs> It's legit. No, but I you know I, I did see the election. I don't, I don't know if we have any comments other than to say what we I guess what we all thought was going to happen happened. And, yeah, exactly. Uh, I don't think it has consequences for the world we're talking about pension funds. Mm. Um, but you know. I'd love to hear your thoughts if you have any, or we move on to, to I, something else. Yeah, I think let's move on. I mean, I, um, you know, I'm just glad to know that uh, the future of uh, of the pancakes in your house and everyone else's is secure. Uh, you know, but yeah, what's yeah. up in your world? Yeah, so I, I told I, you know, the 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 grand total of the planning was me letting Sloan know I had a little, I had a gear grind today <laughs> that I wanted to uh, to riff on with you, which which will actually include a quiz, so you'll probably want to. Mm-hmm pay attention here. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I've been blown away to see how fast all these pension funds has, have reacted to the Ken Fisher comments. Um, for those people that aren't aware, Ken Fisher, finance man, hedge fund man goes out and, and likens raising capital to sex and, and make some dick, dick jokes in the process in Uh, in a conference. And not even good um, dick jokes. Let's be honest. No here. bad dick jokes. Yeah, and imagine like, even laugh. Yeah. I groaned. Yeah, like, exactly. Really? Um, you would want one. One does wonder if it was a hilarious dick joke. If any of this would be happening. But anyways, <laughs> leaving that aside, I, to see pension funds move this fast. Yep. So as of this moment, it's three billion dollars that have been withdrawn for his comments. 
I mean, and I, it, virtue signaling is like one of the most powerful forces in the world, I guess, is what this proves, right? Like, I mean, it's, I can't imagine these funds were performing that well. I mean, because the fee, as reported, the fees on the, on the Fisher investment products right. are right. astronomical. Right. Um, oh, yeah. You know, and uh, I think actually the tenure, there, there was a tenure track record of one of their funds that was reported at something like 500 basis points behind the bench. Um, now, that, now that's a dick joke right there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you know, so like, you know, where's ten- our, where, where's the soundboard when I need it? I'm going to get this podcast up a level. Uh, okay. But here, my point isn't that I want to talk about Ken Fisher's bad dick jokes. My point is these bureaucracies, these pension mm. funds that are massive, they make up the base of our capitalist system. And I focus on them, not because I think they move quickly, but because when they move, they move markets. Yeah. So if you can get a pension fund to change the way they deal with some of these types of risks or issues, whether it's private prisons or coal companies or any number of things, which we'll get to in a second, you can move markets. Yeah. And so the fact that we were able to have this this joke that was inappropriate lead to $3 billion in withdrawals over the course of, gosh, less than a month. Yep. It left me just being like, what the F? <laughs> why, is, why is this the thing? And, and so part of what I wanted to do today with you, Sloan, was to say, can I just run you through three of the risks that I'm working on right now? And, and then we can kind of talk through yep. which of the risks are the most critical Mm -hmm. But even more so, what I want you to think about as I talk these through is which are the easiest to hardest for pension funds to take on. Got it. There's actually four here, but but we've just talked about the first one. So it's it's dick jokes, Mm -hmm. um, inappropriate sexual jokes and innuendo. And, uh, and so that's the first one. So we know that's very easy for for pension funds to deal with. Right. Yeah. You know, when you see it. You know it, right? Yeah. And so we and we've seen such an action that we know that that's actually quite easy, and they and they deal with it quickly. The next three that I'm going to talk through quickly are climate change, mm-hmm. the threat of technological disruption, and a crowd pleaser, racism. Oh, oh, oh man! So climate change. This is you know human beings polluting the planet, potentially driving all human beings underground or off the planet. Uh, these emissions are linked with capitalism. The owners of all the capital go by the names of pension funds, sovereign funds, endowments, foundations. You could think they would have a role to play in preventing this crisis. Okay. Yeah, yeah. For, first risk. Second yeah. risk, tech disruption. Driverless cars, drones, technology is changing the way you know capital is invested. It's changing the way the assets we're invested in function. It's threatening malls and parking lots and all these different types of things. It's a threat to portfolios. Clearly, pensions should be thinking about how technological disruption in the future is going to affect them, their business model, their portfolios, et cetera. Yeah. That's the second one. Third one, racism. <laughs> this is the one where one race of people, typically the whites, tend to favor their own race of people, the yeah. whites when they're giving out jobs or mandates or services or whatever. We did this paper. We showed that racial bias is something that's still real. doesn't mean that people are bad. It just means the norms in our society tend to favor these, these, these kind of communities that are established and yeah. acting. And in this case, we're conditioned to see people in finance as white. And yep. so that drives behaviors. So there you go. Th- those are the, the three in, on top of Ken Fisher's dick jokes that I want to talk about. Okay. Which are we going to integrate into finance? Which do you think of all those should be the easiest to the hardest for a pension fund or a sovereign fund or an endowment to integrate into their investment decision making? Well, I mean, dick jokes and racism are already well integrated into investment decision making. Well, oh, oh but by, I, I don't mean racism. <laughs> That's a good point. I mean uh, reactions to racism. Well, correct. So I'm not reactions. saying let's be racist. I'm well, saying. Let's yeah. find ways not to be racist. No, exactly. You know? exactly. <laughs> I know you. I know you know, but I'm just clarifying. <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, like it's. I like. I, you know, I think that. You know, in. Uh, you know, so I, I sort of class the dick jokes and racism and the climate and tech tech disruption um, as as two separate problems in a way. Where, mm. um, you know, uh, you, but I mean, dick jokes are you know basically we're we're basically talking about chauvinism and racism. 
um, right? And those are things that exist and need to be mitigated inside mm. of inside of the the folks inside in the room, right? And so, um, in this political climate or whatever, uh, <laughs> you know, I, like I think that there is uh, a certain pressure incumbent on all thinking people to, um, you know, be ever better every day. Mm -hmm. um, on those two things, right? Whereas with climate and tech disruption, those are, those are far off uncertainties where there's not yeah. generally an operative process, right? Yeah. And the problem is how to go from zero to one, you know? I, lo uh, I love, I love all that. And, yeah. and I think that's, that's going to dovetail perfectly with what I'm about to say. The one that's weird is, is the dick one. And, and I'll get to that at the end, but dicks are weird. Racial, ra racial bias should be it should be the easiest okay in part because financial theory tells us that if we have any bias that shrinks the size of the investable universe we're focused on yep. that it should reduce our risk adjusted returns and it's our fiduciary duty to overcome that bias and so when we're dealing with um, racism we have a easy kind of a movement to start Mm. around expanding the investable universe to improve returns. It's yeah. such a luxury to be fighting a war where returns are worse today than they would be if we got rid of this risk. So to me, that's, you know, white belt, that's yellow belt. And there's no one that it's going to be about racism whatsoever, right? But, right, but it exists. Like it's, it's there. Yeah, it's, we, we yeah. got the data. It's there. I mean, if you've ever been to an asset management conference, you already knew <laughs> Um, you yeah, know, we just happened to, with this paper, prove that water makes you wet. So that, <laughs> that's now proven, which is, a, I mean, that's disruptive and it's in and of itself, but y y I mean, you're right. It's, it's one of those things where, um, you know, given, uh, the presence of mind to recognize, um, exactly, you know, that, that one is blind to such a clear, uh, you know, set of opportunities, uh, you know, as those that one is precluded from kind of incorporating based on a racial uh, or ethnic bias, you know, I mean, like, yeah, that, it, it should be easy. Although the thing is, there's a pipeline problem there. And there there are, you know, uh, inside of the racism issues, right, it may not it may not just be that, you know, there's a, a large set of, uh, you know, folks in the social networks of the people in the in the plans um, that pitch mm -hmm. and don't get, you know, successful things. It's, it's, there's a lack of connectivity between, mm -hmm. um, you know, set A and set B. Um, you know, that's, that's a huge problem as well. Well, so you're, you're beginning to foreshadow where, where this is going to all kind of come to in the oh, end, which, wow. is, which is the question of resourcing Yeah, and, and, and the resources it takes to solve these problems. But, mm. but let's, let me save my big reveal. Um, <laughs> okay. Okay. For for the end, but but so you're spot on. R racial bias should be the easiest. It, it it should if we get rid of it, returns should improve. The the kind of orange belt, purple belt. I don't do karate, but I'm guessing. Yeah, purple uh, seems like the biggest belt. Purple seems like it's a middle belt to me. To me, the black belt. Oh yeah. Some, well, you know. purple's higher Anyways, than orange. Anyway, <laughs> tech tech disruption is the purple belt, right? So it's medium difficulty. We're we're um. We're asking you to start considering how technology is going to disrupt your portfolio and your business model, which may mean avoiding certain assets and focusing others, which is quite hard for pension funds to do. Because if they're reverting back to the kind of traditional financial theories, now we're saying, mm, don't invest in this, focus on that. That shrinks my market. That means my risk adjusted returns might be lower. So I better be really good at picking those assets because I'm no longer just doing a broad market portfolio, which exposes me to career risk or political risk or any number of things. So, yeah. so the tech disruption is, is harder than racial bias, but it's, it's still inevitable. And that's the part that makes it easier than some of the other risks, which we're going to get to in a second. Yeah. There's driverless cars on the road today. We see the drones, we've got robots rolling around Mars. Um, yep. The only thing that government can do here is actually to slow down tech disruption. No, 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 no. You can't use those drugs yet. CRISPR needs more yep. work. Or, you know, we can't let these cars drive yet. You know, we can't have vertical takeoff, freaking hover drones, you know, driving people to work yet. Yep. 
Um, but it's coming. And so the, the, the pension fund CIOs, and I talked to them about this. In fact, we're doing a project on tech disruption right now. It's much easier for them to wrap their heads around this one. The hardest one, the black belt, is climate change. Mm. Because we are asking you pension funds to shrink your opportunity set to avoid the dirty, the emitter, um, with the view to investing in the clean and green. And that means, um, at least in the short run, giving up return. Mm. Now, we can start to get creative like we have done, but it requires creativity to start to think about climate risk as a threat to assets, to um, embedded in due diligence processes, uh, to even trying to show how companies that are efficient with their carbon emissions can outperform because carbon efficiency is a signal for good management and other things. Mm. But integrating climate change is way harder because it goes against the fundamental theories of finance. Mm. And so um, all of this w would seem to tell you that um, – Racial bias is the easiest, right? It, it should even be easier than than the dick joke, the the Fisher situation, because the Fisher is a divestment. You know, yeah. you're removing something from the portfolio. The next so should go racial bias, dick jokes, tech disruption, climate change, based on all the way these organizations work. But the reveal at the end here is actually that divestments are just easy. That these organizations. <laughs> These organizations are under-resourced. They've got 22 problems today. Yeah. They're trying to figure out how to pay Wall Street less, how to um, manage risk, how to build their systems, how to do this and that. It goes, oh, this is my life. Yeah. They've got endless challenges and they don't have resources for it. And these are mission-driven people. They're underpaid and, and the organizations aren't humming along. Yeah. And so even though we would much rather they spend their time on figuring out how to integrate climate change, understanding tech disruption, and definitely taking the low-hanging fruit of racial bias and using it as an opportunity to bring equality to markets. Instead, they do the thing that requires almost zero resources. Yep. And that is fire a manager that is an idiot. Um, we all acknowledge that. Yep. But... Um, but for which, you know, it's not hard. It takes the CIOs two minutes to do that. Whereas all well, these yeah, other I mean, things I've I, described I mean, are much who, more difficult who wants and, to... and frankly, much more important. Well, well, if you think about what you have to pitch, right? Like the, and just the anatomy of the conversation surrounding it. You know, I have to, if, I, if I'm going in front of a board um, to talk about integrating climate, there's no way that gets done in one meeting. Um, totally. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. The you have to put forward a framework and all this other stuff. Whereas, I mean, you have like almost a, I mean, the degree of self interest you have to have, you know, in having nothing to do with Ken Fisher at this point, um, you know, is substantial as any institutional. I I was candidly shocked that 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 Fisher Investments managed a penny of institutional money. Mm. Um, no, it's massive. You Google it. It's still, I mean, we talk about all this three billion. That's three percent. Yep. Yeah. It's huge. Like, but the, the status quo bias carries on. Do you know the, the, the do you know that he doesn't allow his staff to, to recruit people in the town that he lives? Yeah, but like he literally doesn't allow his cold callers to call people in the community that he lives in because he doesn't want to actually meet clients in the flesh. You know. It, it, <laughs> <laughs> wow. I mean, this there is you like go. you know. I mean, uh, he, he, the guy is a caricature. Uh, uh, of yeah. A, yeah. Pro a problematic investment man, you know, and it's like, if not for the dick jokes, for, if not for the under underperformance, just for the many like you know incongruent things that come out of like just you know straightforward objective reporting about the the organization, uh, you know, a serious investor should should have no nothing to do with them, you know, <laughs> and, and like, um, if but it's. To me, it's a reminder of like, first of all, how hard it is to get meaningful change yep. in this industry. Yep, yep, yep. I guess like I'm, I'm sitting here, I haven't really w thought of all this together, but, but I was sitting, you know, around last night thinking this dude is getting hammered by pension funds, some, and yet like the real hard issues that I've been working on for 15 years, like climate change, I promise you there's still pensions sitting around today saying, do I really have to pay attention to this? Yeah. 
Like, what yeah. can I do to like just make this go away? Yeah, it's not if not us who, if not now when. It's have we got to do this? Yeah, it's, do we got to do this? Yeah, like uh, what can I do to like get my stakeholders off my back? And yeah, um, which, yeah. which is by the way a reminder that the way you get these pension funds to do anything is you go to the, talk to their boards of directors and get these things minuted and on the record. Mm. And you know, you start talking to pension fund boards and you say, "Hey, have you seen that paper that <laughs> Dr. Aberhart and Dr. Monk and others wrote on racial bias and how we're leaving money on the table. You know, like all of a sudden those boards have to pay attention. But if, if they, if they can, if they can ignore it, they will ignore it because they're so busy solving all the other problems. Yeah. They, they can only solve one at a time. And I guess that's also what frustrates me about this Fisher thing. I know from personal experience that you get like one or two things a year. Yeah. With these pension funds, you don't get to do a Fisher divestment and a climate risk tool. You can do one or the other. Mm. They don't have the resources or the manpower or the bandwidth or the, even just like the willingness to do 14 innovative things in a year. Yep. So so this was the thing. I mean, are we like th- are we happy about it? like, yeah, maybe we screwed this guy a little bit. But like he still got ninety nine billion dollars under management. Yeah, but exactly. It, that must be so hard. But um, how many pension funds then said, "Well, instead of this year's project being understanding how a- autonomous cars are going to affect our toll road investments, and instead di- di- divested from this guy's you know nasty way of like communicating." Like that's just fucking drives me crazy. Sorry for the f bomb. Hey, no, um, I mean it, this yeah. is a family podcast, but it's appropriate in this case. I mean, uh, yes. like every once in a while, you got to swear with your kids so they understand how mad you are. You know, yeah, maybe yeah. not. Maybe that's well, not true. Well, no, I don't I swear mean, with my kids. Don't tell anybody that. <laughs> no, but like I, you know, I think that you know, in uh, you know, I have this somewhat dark view that yeah, I mean, like sometimes you see um, like a mechanical view of progress expressed where. Um, you know, particularly as regards diversity or inclusion, you know, where there's sort of like a point out on the horizon that we can conceive of where all these problems will be solved. Um, and, you know, like, I just don't buy it. Um, and part of it's because yeah. of exactly what you're talking about. Like the, you know, the so many cross cutting pressures um, on the folks that are uh, empowered to steward and, you know, kind of steer these very important, you know, ships of capital, um, to actually make a difference, you know, it, like it, it's always, it's, you know, it's always going to be whack-a-mole at the end of the day, Mm -hmm. you know, and the, the question for the sort of activist, I guess, you know, which, uh, is probably you, me and the two people listening to this, um, you know, yeah, exactly. What's up? <laughs> um, what are you guys doing? Weird. Yeah, exactly. Or is this me and you again later when we're listening to it again? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and uh, <laughs> it's me and you now, and then it's me and you later when we're listening again. Yeah, well, in our in our editor Andy. Uh, <laughs> Hi, Andy. Hi, Andy. Hi, Andy. Like when he's listening Thank through you this, for doing this, you do a great job. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Uh, but you know, like I, I get the question is how do we get this thing? How do we get these questions minuted? Right. How do you get the conversations to rise to the level of the boardroom again and again and again in a productive way? Yeah. Um, You know, so that you can get past the, you know, corrective signaling and and all that stuff and get to, you know, how drones are going to fundamentally change the nature of infrastructure in the United States. This this leads me, we can move on to the questions in a second, but one more point here, which is, you know, I had mentioned about the technology that all the policymakers can really do is delay the inevitable. So like the driverless cars are coming, right? Like at a, at a certain point, the driverless car is going to be way better than the human drivers, you know? Um, but the, the policymakers can slow it down. They can make that, that inevitability happen five years, 10 years, two years later than it might've otherwise. Yeah. The thing with climate change is we rely on these intergenerational rulemaking bodies to take the things that are existential threats, but are existential threats 50 years from now and make them real today. And so if, yep. if we can't have our policymakers and look, dude, I, I'm a, I'm a person who really wants to like motivate entrepreneurs and innovators and, and, and kind of free market actors to go and take on these problems. 
But I have to say, in watching the reaction to climate change and and then seeing how some of these other risks are taken into consideration by long-term investors and acted upon, we probably need governments to make climate change real for people today. Yep. By putting a price on carbon, by, you know, taxing emitters, whatever it is, it, if this is a threat that we all agree with the science, we need to manage you know, maybe the the scale of the threat we can debate, but just about all same sane humans would agree there's a threat. Mm. Then, then we need to we need the help of these intergenerational bodies to make that something that has consequences today, so that we don't have to live underground in the future. Yeah, I so mean, that's me me saying getting the things minuted and into agendas of formal policy groups will help us activate those policy communities to take these things seriously. And, and yeah. I think, I think too, you know, it's funny. I, I was just watching, uh, I mean, uh, representative Elijah Cummings passed away recently, civil rights hero in Baltimore. Um, uh, long time, long time congressman. Uh, I was just watching former president Obama's speech at that funeral, uh, right before this. And I'm kind of like tearing up thinking about this. Um, but one of the things president Obama brought up in that conversation was a, a saying of, uh, Representative Cummings, that was, uh, that, you know, you would say all the time, uh, you know, our children, our emissaries, emissaries, we send forth to a future we will never see. Um, you know, yeah. and like, I think if there is a space for hope in the conversation, it's that, you know, like every seven year old I've talked to gets this. Um, right. you know, and they're going to be sitting yeah. there at the breakfast table for the next decade going, why, 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 why is mm -hmm. this not working? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so I mean, minutes can help, but, uh, you know, ideally, you know, when the, <laughs> uh, the people who are the actual decision makers are, are, uh, are facing pressure at story time, in addition to, uh, you know, their serialized board meetings, it'll really start to, um, take shape. But on that well, note, <laughs> on that, on that <laughs> note, let's see where this goes. <laughs> Um, yeah, on that note, it's, uh, time for Dear Ashby. This is the, oh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Total change. Total uh, change. yeah, cue the air horn. Um, <laughs> um, the, you know, this is the segment, dear listener, uh, and Andy, um, where we take questions from listeners and friends on the dark web, um, for Dr. Monk here. And, uh, we do in fact, ask them at, uh, put them as asked and, and discuss them. The first one this week uh is a reference to the ongoing i guess at this point several criminal investigations um surrounding you know various stuff in the ukraine um have you ever come across a company with a worse name than fraud guarantee that of course being the consulting firm uh <laughs> operated by uh one of uh america's mayor rudy giuliani's uh associates uh, ashby like uh, i mean is, you is, know what? it's hard to be that one it's hard. I mean, like, that's like, go, that goes down in like the drain the swamp kind of category of like irony. Um, <laughs> you know, they were nominating another lobbyist to run another federal agency. But anyway, we'll leave that for another time. Drain the swamp. Um, fraud guaranteed. So look, I have two. I have two. You mentioned this one to me earlier. And I have two that I have worked with. So I need to be careful because they're friends of mine. Let me say... Both these companies are doing incredible work that I'm about to tell you. And I, have <laughs> joked, and I have joked with the founders of both of them about the name. Not that they love the jokes when I say them, because I think they're like, I've heard that 400 times. Yeah, exactly. But then I think to myself, but have you really? Because you left the name, you know? So if you <laughs> really heard this joke 400 times, wouldn't you just change the name? Anyway, here's, the first one is... Uh, a, a, an awesome company that helps pension funds and sovereign funds and all these big institutional investors recover the class action um, claims that that are very often uh, and get left on the table. Yeah. And so these guys are out there helping these these asset owners collect what's theirs. It's like free money. Yeah. And it's it's called Except not as well branded. Go for it. Not as well branded. No. Well, you're about to you you, you be the judge. Uh Financial recovery technologies sounds great until you realize they go by their acronym, FRT. <laughs> <laughs> 
and Aww. and I've noted that, and it, and it's a tough one for a company that's doing such amazing things, and and because I've outed them as being fart, I encourage any pension fund listening to go and use their services because they are wonderful people, and I can vouch for them. Uh, the second one is a great one doing um, surveys of of you know mobile telephony surveys in emerging markets to try to understand things like development or um, fear in places like Afghanistan. So they're going and doing these really great um, local surveys of populations to understand if they're afraid, if they're feeling secure. And because of the era of the, the mobile phone, you can actually go and, and get data on the ground, even in places like China. Very hard to regulate or, or prevent that kind of data from emerging. That's so cool. You just literally dial a phone number. Yeah, it's one of the coolest companies. And, and the guy came out of like the um kind of the international organization world and and he called it orange door research what and it sounds super great until you realize he also is using the initials odr <laughs> and it's odor and uh and so those two aren't terrible they're not quite as bad as fraud guarantee but fart and odor are my two companies that i've always wondered why they named them that I, I would, uh, that's, that's amazing. Uh, I mean, cause you know, obviously, you know, acronyms or everything is going to get acronymized except for my candidate for this. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad you have one. So I've got left <laughs> as the only jerk out of their friends' companies. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, so anyone who's done work in, um, a multi-asset portfolios and risk reporting and stuff like that has probably come across a, uh, a, a report generation tool provided by ICE data services called bond edge no <laughs> yes. um, which, that's so much better than mine mine are the worst <laughs> compared to bond edge like, like <laughs> which is unbelievable oh. <laughs> i mean you know it, like in my house we have three rules uh no queer sh- no queer shaming no kink shaming and no body shaming so i don't want to cast any aspersions on practitioners of bondage, but uh, <laughs> um, you don't want that showing up on your credit card. You know yeah, I mean? exactly. I mean, like, it, especially. I mean, this is obviously expensing. You're expensing this. I actually have filed an expense report to a client with this. Anyway, That's so good. <laughs> what, is, what the heck are you doing, Swan? Bondage. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I need to pay for bondage. I mean, like, what are you doing spending twenty five hundred dollars on bondage a month? <laughs> um, oh gosh. Yeah, the world Very is a, good. the world's a strange place. All right. So, question two: um, What do you believe about investing, but know that you could never prove? This one is from me. Um, it, it's one. Yeah. Of, it's one of my favorite questions. Uh, I, I wish there was more comedy here, but, but I actually am just going straight with it, which is to say, I I think that all investors that are amazing investors are probably like only mediocre at picking investments. Mm. Uh, I can't prove that, but, but I think the success, all the investors that I've gotten to know up close and, and, and so there's a, I'll admit there's probably a tilt to private equity, venture capital, and then pension funds. That's those are the kind of the industries that I spend a lot of time in and meet and meet like the best. Yeah. I mean, I just am lucky to have met the best. And and th- their success is much more about the quality of all the inputs. So the in venture capital, it's the reputation, the network leads to the most amazing funnel of deal flow. Yeah. And then literally you could just throw darts at that funnel and do better than anybody else's funnel because the quality of the funnel is that much better. And I, I see this time and time again where if you can really maximize the quality of inputs in this production function of investing, then that moment when you're finally picking deals um, becomes less valuable. Yep. I don't think these investors exist that like just get on the computer and are like, that's the company. That's the one, <laughs> yep. you know? It, yep. it's, uh, it's, it's hard to prove, but, but that's what I believe. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, it's, it is, uh, you know, I've, I've met people who claim to be that person, but, um, you know, I mean, absent, like maybe Michael Burry is an example of somebody who can just right. like, oh, yeah. you know, sit by themselves in the dark and index bubble. 
Yeah, no, but that's the question. Was he right once? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I don't think of it, indexes as a giant bubble. But anyway, he'll he'll laugh at me one day when. Yeah, exactly. You know, off. when when uh, the world is over and we're we're sitting there, you know, eating, um, uh, you know, just whatever, you know, broken up uh, bits of concrete. Um, my, you know, I would say uh, I strongly believe, but cannot prove that Jeffrey Epstein was murdered. Um, <laughs> Interesting. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, and you know, I, I, it just, you know, I, I don't think that that's at all a uh, a speculative position at this point. Uh, Correct. The uh, all right, last one. Uh, what's the best financial advice you've ever gotten from someone outside the industry? I don't. I don't trust anybody in that finance industry. This from my yeah. grandpa. No, I, like, I don't. I try. Uh, I try not to talk to anyone in that industry. <laughs> <laughs> not on my dad. My 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 dad's side had dude people in finance. On so my mom's side, you know, he was a blue collar. Um, he was in the Navy in World War II. He was a border guard, um, and at the Edmonton Airport, um, and uh, just you know didn't have a lot of trust for the finance people and felt like there was something wrong, and so you know it's just it's an. It, He's not in finance, right? He's, he's a border guard whose job it is to uh, look at people and assess intentions mm -hmm. and how many people cross the border, you know. And so for him, uh, unlike today where border guards use, you know, <laughs> race, creed, and a bunch of other things as heuristics for taking them into the back room, one of his heuristics was <laughs> finance. Oh, you work in finance? I don't trust you. Get in that oh. back room, young man. Oh my! Oh, he's just like my That's my funny. girlfriends in Brooklyn who just like, oh, you work in finance? Oh, cool. Uh, I I'm just gonna go over there. I gotta go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's. I mean, you know, like, hey, if you don't get you involved, go. you can't get hurt. Um, I think that's. I, you know, I I actually I had somebody. Um, you know, who is that? Like, I, I don't really. Uh, surround myself with characters who who look like they would be just casually dispensing, um, you know, good advice about uh, you know wh where to allocate money. But um, I, I rode the elevator with one of my neighbors uh, who had their hair gelled up into a thick point uh, um, oh. the other day, um, and they were on their phone with their like little adorable dog, um, and they, <laughs> they literally go, "What CDs? You're never going to get any kind of return at three percent. Come on." Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's actually a decent return what the hell <laughs> for a cd <laughs> what well, you should have been like what's the duration on that what do you got yeah I, yeah exactly like i mean Ash, what's the lockup Ash, you are, are have fallen victim to the subtle tyranny of low expectations my friend i have <laughs> i have we've been in a low interest rate environment for so long man that, that uh <laughs> that three percent CD that sounds not too shabby. Yeah, yeah. It's I mean, look, I, I think we, you know, we all can get excited. You know, I'm not, I'm not here to shame you for uh, for what gets you off. Thank you. you. Know? Thank um, you. If, if a three yeah. percent fixed income return is is what does it for you, then you know who am I to judge? <laughs> what are you? Uh, yeah, I don't know what to invest in these days. I invest in private companies and then um, put my cash under a mattress somewhere not my mattress so don't come to my house but i don't know what to do with it yeah i uh i just keep um you know my all my cash in a random assortment of foreign currencies that i keep in um alphabetized envelopes underneath my desk that's great yeah, yeah. no that's a good move that's yeah. uh i treat them like pokemon cards you know uh, that is good <laughs> collect them all collect i'm a them all. I'm, I'm a currency trader uh, <laughs> oh, that's amazing. <laughs> All right. That is, I think we just got to, that might be a, one of our, our offshoot businesses of which we have a few brewing. Oh, oh yeah. Currency and actually, trader. I have an announcement. I have news for you. I have news for our listeners. Uh, a prototype of Portable Alpha is on its way to my house and will arrive on Monday. Um, oh my god <laughs> this is huge this has been in r d for at least tens of days yeah exactly it's a big deal um you know portable alpha is uh, a new uh beverage from the creators of free money um you know <laughs> backed by so you Stan can take it with you you can take it with you and generate alpha gym. uh you know backed by stanford research obviously <laughs> I mean, like with the support of Stanford Research, I don't know if we're yeah. going to put the full weight of Stanford Research behind it. 
<laughs> um, uh, but yeah, like, uh, you know, look forward to, uh, you know, I mean, of, of course, the color of Alpha officially is orange. Um, yes. Uh, I was hoping. I was hoping it'd be orange. Yep. So uh, get ready. Quick I'll, question for Portable Alpha. Can you juice your Alpha with a bit of alcohol in there? Does oh, yeah. Does it taste good? Okay, um, so that's well, like leverage on the Porter Alpha. Porter yeah, Alpha. I'm gonna I'm gonna send. I'm once I receive it, what I'll do is I'll uh, you know kind of um, <laughs> I'll create sort of a, a collateralized. You know, I'll, I'll slice it up. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, oh yeah please send me baggies of powder that will that will be great <laughs> yes. that's that's literally what i'm going to do uh, <laughs> i know i look forward to receiving but it's if there's authorities listening it's literally portable alpha okay? yeah exactly it's like you can't hate me we're just trying to save pension funds here okay like i you you gotta you gotta get the alpha wherever you uh, can get it we're trying to keep this podcast free to everybody all right yeah so if ashby's not arrested um you know <laughs> <laughs> or I'm not arrested for uh, either mail fraud or uh, trafficking stuff that's too good to share. Um, we'll we'll catch you all next time on the Free Money Podcast. And we'll love you very much until then. We do. Mm. Bye. Bye.